we're doing something today that um, Michael doesn't usually do, which is we actually have a very scripted lecture. And usually my lectures are scripted, but they're scripted in a deeply personal, uh, I've started using a word that makes people upset, uh, intuitive way. We are very much uh, not enough interested in how the way our minds think about things on a deeply uh, psychological level. So I, I actually have a, a little scripted talk to give you, but I'm, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story to try to warm myself up to the idea that we're going to do this this way. Um, so my dad died six or seven years ago. And right before he died, um, I was sitting with him. And uh, he, he had a great long life. He lived to 87. And I think he felt pretty good about things, but he said, you know, I want to tell you something. Like, first of all, my father was not a big talker um, at all. Um, and, he's, and I'm like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> this guy who hasn't basically told me anything my whole life is going to tell me something. This could be a momentous moment. And it turned out it was. He said, you know, uh, you have a great grandfather who's quite similar to you. And I said, oh, um, and it was his mom's father. So my grandma Van Valkenburg's father. He said he really liked trees. I said, oh. Um, he said, no, he really liked trees, like the way you do. Um, and then he went on to tell me that this great-grandfather that I had known, of course we all know we have great-grandfathers, but I knew very little about this guy. Um, and he also was the Welsh-Irish grandfather who gave me my, he gave this guy with a Dutch name a complexion that looks like I'm Irish. So, and I am one-eighth Irish from him, but he, wrote poems about trees. I didn't, I grew up in a farming family. You don't write poems, okay? <laughs> he sold fruit trees as his business before, before FedEx. So he bought trees and, you know, I grew up in upstate New York. And so he made a living selling fruit trees to people. And I said to my father, I said, you know, why didn't you tell me about this guy? And he said, well, I didn't want to think I like you and I didn't like him and I didn't want to think that you were any more like him other than this, but I thought you should know about this thing that you share. I'm telling you that because it relates to one of my bigger themes and not to make it too personal about myself, but through personal example to say something about all of us. And it's related partly to something Gail said, which is I do believe we all arrive in the world with very unique characteristics that are partly an imprint of our long evolution as a species. One can well imagine that my great-grandfather, who liked trees, had a relative who similarly came with this very peculiar thing, which my DNA makes me like trees. It's just, it's, this is not because somebody told me trees were cool when I was little. They did not tell me that when I was growing up. I was aware of it on my own. And I say that as a segue to this park because I think that we, as a society, as a, as a, as a culture in the world, have begun to reconnect with the idea that there is something deeply necessary 
about the way many of us are made more complete by the experiences that we have with the natural world. Um, I found my way to designing parks very kind of unexpectedly, and that's another story. But I wanna talk today about this incredible invitation that we've received to, to ponder the idea of turning the floodway of the Trinity and to, to make something terribly important, very clear. We have not designed a park to go in the Trinity. We have for a little less than a year been doing preliminary planning and thinking with a whole large group of other people here in Dallas. And the way that we do that in our office is a kind of enactment of design. Um, it so happens, and, I, and I'll explain more about it later, um, uh, we have, as a firm, become very knowledgeable about how to make parks in areas where flood water in recurring but temporary periods cover the lands with water in a whole variety of settings. But let's talk about park making. So, um, To draw, and this is a somewhat artificial distinction, but as a way of, I think um, Liz and I, who helped me put this talk together, trying to show you how unafraid we are of the idea of making a park in that flood way. Because I think that for many people, it's like where they see it full of water and they're like, oh good heavens, like how, how could we ever have a park there. So, you know, back in the day, and, uh, and o F o Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox um, won a competition to design Central Park in uh, 1858. I think I have that right. Was saying 59 all last week, and then we were corrected. Um, and what the way Central Park was made um, is rather similar to the way many, many, not all, many parks were made in the 19th century. There certainly were urban parks that were folded directly into the fabric of cities, much more specifically than I'm suggesting here. But for instance, in, in Philadelphia, where there are these incredible squares that are also parks. But in the 19th century, very commonly, we made parks at the periphery of cities. And often, they had some or many natural features about them that in some way were emboldened or enhanced or completely reinvented in the process of them being made. And man, you know, if you don't think this is amazing, I, I don't want to know you. Um, I mean, come on. I mean, this is crazy. And the city fathers at the time who were inventing the idea of the modern city, they were talking about sanitation in New York and library systems and schools and a park system to make the city what it needs to be for urban dwellers. So fast forwarding to today, you know, round numbers, I'm not great with math, 150 years-ish later, we are in a fantastic period in American history where parks are literally being made all over the place. I mean, we're gonna show you some examples of our other work next, but this is the waterfront of Brooklyn in the 1980s just before the arrival of the container shipping system, which made obsolete this pier. Somebody had this great idea that you should put stuff in a container and it should never come out of the container until it's going where it's going. And that was not the idea here. These giant piers in Brooklyn, somebody had the idea right before that idea and they said, oh, we can, eliminate 
a labor step if we unload boats on the Brooklyn waterfront in giant five-acre piers that are essentially warehouses sitting on the edge of the river. And so these enormous piers, five acres is unheard of. All the old piers in Manhattan are, I don't know, 20% uh, of that long, thin piers where things were unloaded and they went someplace else and they were unloaded. And so this is about you know, um, economic efficiency. So just a couple of before and after pictures of the conditions that we found in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Now you might be saying, okay, well, you know, why is Michael showing us this? We really want to understand how he's going to make a park in a floodway that fills up with water once in a while. But it, it's a very similar, it's a very similar mindset that you have to hit, have when you're working on parks like these is that you have to find some intrinsic beauty in the site that you're working with. You are never going to make a park or any landscape on a difficult site if you feel like you got the short end of the stick when it was given to do. You have to come at it looking at what its unique genius is and what its opportunities are. And so, um, for instance, up in Toronto where we're doing a lot of work with Waterfront Toronto, we recently um, created a park on top of essentially one of your levees on the Trinity. It's a single levee. You can roughly understand the top of the levee from the flood crest line. And this was a case where we worked simultaneously with the engineers of the flood control device with placing a park on top of it, but also creating a landscape that slides down the side of that levee and is inundated with flood water when the Don River um, exceeds its banks. And this isn't a natural site at all, and there's very little about nature to, to understand, but this is a roughly 30-acre parking garage in Chicago next to Millennial Park with the, you know, the wonderful Frank Gehry snake-like bridge. You can see it there coming across, where we invented a, a park, which is essentially a family uh, and children playground for the Chicago neighborhoods who, who love Millennial Park, but for whom a lot of the kind of casual things that families and kids do are hard to sustain there. And so it's a, it's a complement by contrast to Millennial Park. Or our early project in um, Pittsburgh, um, where the banks of the Allegheny, um, sometimes with great robustness, um, flood. Uh, we were a little, we had already designed the park on the site on, that you see when this flood event happened and barges and cars and boats and whatnot piled up uh, on the park that we were going to make. And so that influenced our design thinking. So the point that I've been making is that the kinds of sites that we work on today with park making, and I don't know about all those other parks in Dallas that Gail mentioned, but I can imagine many of them come with site histories and things about them that are significantly different than you know, what Olmsted and Vox were doing, basically leaving New York City, going to the outside of New York City and building Central Park. But just for fun, um, I asked one of the people in the office this week to find a bunch of pictures of people doing things in parks in the 19th century, and then to put next to them pictures of things that we do in parks today. And um, people didn't sit around in parks in their underwear in the 19th century, which appears to be what these two guys are doing. Um, um, and But the fact of the matter is that whether it was the 19th century or 150 years later, people were going to parks for essentially very similar reasons, and, and, and many of them are things that Gail was talking about in her talk. I think another thing that is incredible today is, uh, well, we raise children very differently than certainly the way I was raised uh, 
where in first grade children were um, disciplined with a car antenna. I'm sure that you would end up in prison today if that happened. Um, I think she got a very special prize when she retired for all the kids that she had beaten. Um, uh, but we do it differently and we do it better. And parks, the thing, one of the, there are many things that blow our minds at Brooklyn Bridge Park, but one of the things that's utterly amazing is the popularity of the playgrounds. And Matt, more than me, um, was the maker of our incredible Brooklyn Bridge Park playgrounds. But it's just an incredible thing to see um, how valuable the right kinds of playgrounds can be. The other thing is that um, we eat food very differently in parks today. Um, and in Brooklyn Bridge Park, this is not Brooklyn Bridge Park on the right, but we actually have an entire picnic peninsula uh, that sits on the edge of New York Harbor. And I was there on Labor Day morning this year at 6.30 in the morning, and people were showing up to claim their grills and their tables for the day at 6.30 in the morning. It doesn't matter who you are in New York City, you can come and have a grill and sit at a table on the edge of New York Harbor. And I gotta tell you, it's one of the best views in the world. So how do we design a park today? I wish it was a simple answer. Um, but if it's done well, there is a collectiveness about it. It is not somebody with a vision and an architectural motif and it's delivered and it's not how, it's not how, it's just not how it works. We start with a conversation. And honestly, that conversation is hardly started in Dallas about the Trinity. There is a tremendous amount of public outreach and conversation and understanding aspirations that needs to happen. And in Chicago at Maggie Daly Park, the Parks Department had us have a series of meetings all the way around downtown because they wanted to be sure that each of the surrounding neighborhoods with their economic and cultural diversity had a voice. And you know what's really interesting about those public meetings in Chicago? We actually heard almost the same thing from everybody, which was they wanted a place for their kids. They, as I said a minute ago, are incredibly proud of Millennial Park, and there is that beautiful um, fountain and other things that are friendly to kids, but they wanted a place where they could bring kids downtown and spread out a picnic lunch and sit in the shade and um, kids could have a great time. So for our office, at least, that's me in the uh, greenish shirt there. Uh, Matt, where are you? Yeah, be sitting horrified at something I'm saying, I'm sure. Um, that's sort of our relationship uh, as friends. Um, but, f oh yeah, he's looking in the model there, I see him now. We like to work in design with study models where in meetings like this, we can pick things up and move them around. We see, so how do you design a park? You go through a process that's very fluid and dynamic because one of the things that's hard to do is act it will be less hard to do in the Trinity because it's so enormous. But you, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough thing to reconcile the sometimes conflicting things that people say to you. And then when it gets further along, as here in Tulsa, and this is our gathering place, uh, which is about 40% completed up the way, um, this is uh, me waving my hands again. Matt's there too talking to an audience at the end of a year-long process of public meetings where we sat in small groups, meeting after meeting after meeting, hearing ideas, writing them down, reporting them back, creating a website where people could keep track of these. And these are eventually all things that we can imagine will happen here. Sometimes in public meetings, 
people say things that are like a fork in the road. And this is a, a very important person in the history of the neighborhood. She was well along in her life, into her, well into her 80s at this meeting that, that we were, the first meeting for Brooklyn Bridge Park. And she came up to the microphone and she said what I've, what I've written down here, but essentially that she was old and had no place to go anymore and that she wanted Brooklyn Bridge Park to be a place where she could put her toes in the water. Um, this is one of those splits, you know, in time in American urban history. This is the late 90s, and New York City is coming out of this very dark period in park history. Central Park was well along in its restoration, and people were being reminded of what a great park could be. But New York was coming out of a tough time economically and socially, and people were afraid of parks. But this gave us the idea that where the, along with other things, I might add, but gave us the idea that where the, the seawalls and the infrastructure of the edges of the park were deteriorating and falling away, rather than rebuilding those, we could work with ecologists to understand how New York Harbor is tidal, so the water goes up rather significantly. And I also would add that in Hurricane Sandy, there was five feet of salt water across the entire park for several hours. And so here too, and that's the reason for all the armoring with the stone, among other things, that, that we have learned to have this partnership with nature and to collaborate with nature. Um, I, I was with a small group last night and I told the story about my first park, which is in Columbus, Indiana, and I'll just make it quick. <laughs> the very first park that we designed was subject to violent multiple annual inundations of water. I don't know what's the equivalent of that uh, if you're a chef. I don't know. All the groceries arrive from the store already diced up in half inch pieces? I don't know, like you have to learn to cook as a park designer in a very different way if your site goes underwater. And it, what it did for us was to begin a whole series of commissions where we have worked with water in a much more fully engaged way, both in the engineering and the technical detailing, but actually in the overall aesthetic of the places we made. The Bush Library does not go underwater in storm events, but it did afford to us, because of the desire of the president and the first lady, that the building would have a lead platinum. We had to do many things to make sure that we were setting the right example through this project, including the collection of the stormwater on the site and the use of that to create. You know, with Gail, your story about the conflation of geomorphologies here, it's, it's such a reinforcement of what we did at the library because the Laura Bush in particular wanted us to do an interpretation of the, of the Blackland Prairie in an urban setting to, cr to kind of shift the sensibility of Dallas away from the highly irrigated lawns of the city. So anyway, this shows our collection of the roof water. There's a lot of water generated in the archives of the library for um, moisture control. So there's a lot of humidity control that, that releases water. And all of that water, all the runoff of the parking lots is stored in underground cisterns and then we slowly release it, and it becomes these intermittent water elements. So if there's a rain event, you'll go to this place in the library. And for several days afterwards, and only several days, the water will be very slowly trickling out. So, so in one sense, we're making a landscape that's very much like the real. It's highly artificial, but we're doing something that's very much the way water is intermittently present in the, in the um, non-urban landscape uh, uh, around Dallas. But the other thing we're doing is that we're holding the water and not surcharging the storm events, which is 
the kind of thing that's happening that's making the depth of water and the frequency of storms in the Trinity worse over time, that we have in the headwaters more impervious surface in storm events, sending water very quickly into the, into the riverine systems and causing problems. And so it helps in a variety of ways. But here you can see a storm, a thunderstorm event that happened during construction, and it's a kind of flash picture of how the water is collected and then what that is like um, when the storms have passed by. So when Olmsted and Vox were working on Central Park north of the city, they were trying to evoke the rural landscape of upstate New York, but they also were dealing with their own realities of this site. They were not completely trying to make it something that it wasn't. They were looking for cues. That's something that every landscape architect does. For the 21st century landscape architect, you have to embrace the spatial and physical realities of working around, in many cases, infrastructure, if you think about it. So um, here in Toronto, again, we're at the scale of the city, renaturalizing the mouth of the Don River. The red is flood water. The blue is parts of the city that are under flood water because of water breaching the edges of the, of the flood containment areas. And so you can see on the right our design, which creates a new release for the flood water and then builds a whole new neighborhood all of which is outside of the floodway, except notice the blue, which is that we're designing a park inside the area that will be flooded in the most extreme events. And in Waller, it's a little different uh, in Austin, Waller Creek, where conditions like this, um, highly degraded, highly eroded, working with ecologists and uh, soil scientists and and other technical experts rebuilding uh, a, a, an incredible little urban stream in the city. In projects, of course, you get to a point where this all becomes manifest in what you make. It's like the decision the architects made here of the contouring of, of, the, of these walls or, or, or which kind of wood to use, and they become the um, those things become the things that actually speak to us most. All the thinking kind of is in, you know, archives and conversations that have stopped. And when it's done, we make things that have a physical resonance that, that shapes how we feel. Um, and it's extremely important. And I just wanted to show you some of our projects, um, if only to make you hopeful about what we may do in the Trinity that we haven't done yet. But this is our Teardrop Park. Um, not supposed to say these things, still my personal favorite in the firm. It, it does this to you. I'm like, I like to be embraced by landscape. I like to be under trees like that great grandfather. Um, and the way that we work, um, this is actually a collaboration with an artist, Anne Hamilton, and that's her husband, Michael Mersill, and their methodology, and this great stone uh, expert that we were lucky to work with. That's me paying no attention and looking off in the distance, by the way. Um, and what it looks like when it's finished. Uh, my daughter's photo, that's actually a picture of Lexi, my daughter, that she took uh, in front of the wall. She does a lot of photography for the office. Or Javits Plaza, where a different kind of uh, different kind of sensibility um, comes up in Brooklyn Bridge Park. I want to say that in Brooklyn Bridge Park there are many themes, but one of them that we have used uh, extensively is recycling materials found in the city. Uh, we're in the process of recladding the surfacing of a lot of bridges in the city, and all this stone was actually going to get dumped in a landfill and covered up. And, Adrian Benepe, who was the parks commissioner at the time, I think he called up Matt and said, hey, Matt, there's all this granite. Like, do you think you guys could use it? And Matt's like, yeah, well, why don't you bring it over to the site since we had 40 or 50 acres that we wouldn't be building for 
eight or nine years, and we just stacked the stone up and figured out how to use it. And so it was a way of, of Brooklyn Bridge Park becoming incredibly about recycling ma materials of the city, but also a frugality. And of course, five feet of water from Hurricane Sandy is not going to carry away a block of stone like that. So a weightiness of the elements made a lot of sense. We have used no um, unsustainably harvested wood in the park. Um, the, <laughs> the wood we used was unsustainably harvested in the 19th century to cut down the southern yellow pine forests of the south and make the the warehouses of the north, but when we tore down some of these buildings on the site, we, we repurposed the wood, which, let me tell you, as Americans, we just don't have a sensibility in our economics of recycling materials. This was, if we didn't have incredible leadership on the park, this never would have happened, because basically we don't know how yet to save things the way we should, but we made all of the benches from wood that was resawn. And many of you, I'm sure, know the wood. It's a naturally quite rot resistant, which is why they were built. So the Trinity, um, you know the history of moving the Trinity River. There was a terrible flood in Dallas, and right after that, at the turn of the century, an engineering firm was hired to relocate the city. You can see the historic alignment there and the relocation of it and the creation of a pair of eastern and western levees. And, um, you know, you almost can feel when you're there that you have left Dallas. I mean, you haven't. You have Dallas on each side of you. But it is so vast in its scale. And if it ever is fully built out as the park that it could be, you will have a feature that defines this city like no other city that I know. It is simply, I mean, it is unbelievable in its scale and its potential. So, you know, many of the things that I've talked about today have involved finding something that no longer works today like it used to, like the shipping piers in Brooklyn. Like there, there's nothing about shipping on the Brooklyn waterfront. The curious twist in Trinity is that we have to make this park and still accept and welcome the flood water. It's what makes the city possible that it's there. And so, again, have to wear the right glasses. You have to look at that through the right perspective when you think about it. It's not a begrudging necessity. It is literally the thing that makes Dallas possible that the flood water is there, and so that has to be understood. We also find that every time you design a project, and I'm sure this is another thing that crosses from Olmsted to the present, is that there are things that limit what you do, that you have to work with, and you have to just, that needs to make you smile or you should go get an MBA because Adversity and challenge is what being a landscape architect is about. And in the end of the day, when you get comfortable with that, it makes me going to work at 65 as interested in the field as I was in my first internship at 20. So it's a great thing, but if you don't come at it the right way, but it's a very simple idea that you make a series of small neighborhood parks at the level of the top of the levees along the edge. And these are quite urban and maybe not so different from other parks that you have or you're in the process of making playgrounds and maybe water features and lots of shade and benches. And, and when this happens, of course, there will be a rush of residential development up to the edges, this will be one of the best places to live in the city. So there will be neighborhoods of people, and it's happened in Brooklyn in incredibly fast-paced housing developing along the edges of our park. But then you develop what's in, down in the Trinity as a riverine system where you work very carefully to understand the impact of water, and you recontour slightly so that in 
many of the smaller storms, there are pieces of park land that do not go underwater. The floodway currently is flat. As soon as the water comes up, it reaches out and it fills all the way to the edges. If you, and you have to have permission from the Army Corps for this, and it's a negotiation because it displaces some water, uh, but it's, it, it's the kind of thing that they often uh, finally agree to. So that if you lift slightly and, and then accommodate for that water displacement through other decisions, you can basically make a park that does not go underwater except in the most extreme events. And then the other thing you do is the things that are most disturbingly impacted by the flood events, you put those up in the parks that are on the tops of the levees and you put things like trails and athletic fields and all the things that parks all across America along the edges of rivers that flood have. This is not then something that is nearly as difficult to pull off when you extract from the floodway the things that you really don't want to have to spend the money on cleaning up every time it happens. Um, the gateway parks are on the, on the edges of the levees. They become these things that draw you up to look down. Uh, I made this joke last night, I'll say it again. It won't be as good as looking into the Grand Canyon, but it will still be very good. I mean, I'm sure all of you can remember the first time you went up and looked in the Grand Canyon, and honestly, seeing the Trinity similarly the first time was a very powerful experience for me. This is a very unique space in the city. So this is what those upper parts might, parks might feel like. This is what the lower parks. You can feel the distinction, and Olmsted used the word range to refer to many things, um, but the landscape types was one of the things that Olmsted was referring to, and, and all landscape architects today do the same things. We make one kind of landscape over here, we make a different one over there, and depending on who we are and how we thread our walking paths together, these become great ways to enjoy the city. So this I already explained to you, and then this is our quick planning level study model of what this all put together might start to feel like. So that in the end of the day, and you know, this is after a lot of private philanthropy and a lot of support from the city and especially a lot of support from the citizenry of Dallas, we do things like make places of assembly in the Trinity and places for play and an attitude about being playful and places for biking, and places to just wander. Um, places for sports, we like to be very active in parks today. Places to just do nothing, hang out. Places for recreation. Places for exploration, for contemplation, and places that support the life of the city. Thank you very much.